Revelation 21, verse 4, we read that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. This is uh, speaking of the curse that is one of the first things that occurred in this creation. Didn't take Adam and Eve very long to rebel against the will of God and to impose their own in rebellion against God. And as a result of that, earth was cursed and mankind had uh, these negative results from separating themselves spiritually from God which would ultimately result in physical separation of the soul and the body in death. But Genesis 3.16 records the curse on the woman. And he says to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and your childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So here we have pain, both or the multiplication, both of pain and and of childbirth, we'll see that because death has been introduced into the human race, childbirth is going to need to be increased to keep up with the rate of death. That's why we get issues like there is currently in uh, the country of Japan, where the death rate exceeds the birth rate, and they fear for how they're going to continue to populate their country. Imagine that on a global scale, where the birth rate's not keeping up with the death rate. God increased the rate of childbirth. Now, this may mean that uh, the gestation period was shortened, but more likely it means uh, that the time period between births would be increased, perhaps the frequency of um, ovulation. It could mean that now twins were made possible, triplets, quadruplets, that might be less likely. Um, but in any case, there's also the presence of pain being added to this process of childbirth. Again, there's a few different interpretive options for this. This could be the physical pain of bearing children um, was now intensified, but it could also mean that the giving birth to children who are already destined to die is a painful thing for a mother to watch. Um, I think in this case, both might be true, especially since when this curse is referred to in other places in scripture, it seems to be that the pain of childbirth is that these children die. Uh, children or childbirth was originally created in the original plan of God for unfallen man to give birth to unfallen children that do not have death already in their bodies. But we see that death is transferred through reproduction of the fallen humankind because of the doctrine of seeds, where in Genesis 1 uh, verse 11, we see that God built this reproductive system in the entire world, even among plants and animals and um, humankind, that uh, the seed reproduces in like kind. Therefore, if we have fallen mankind that is separated from God, when they reproduce, they reproduce a fallen human being that is separated from God. And so for now, contrary to the original plan of God, when humankind reproduces, they reproduce fallen human beings. And so Isaiah 65, 23 says, they will not labor in vain, looking forward here to the kingdom where the curse is rolled back. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. They will not bear children for the purpose of those children dying eventually. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord, the restoration of creation blessing through the new covenant and their descendants with them. Jeremiah 31, 15 looks at the same thing. Thus says the Lord, a voice heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. Rachel here is a figurehead of, um, of Israel, so the children of Israel. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. This is when uh, the children of Israel were hauled off to Babylon in the captivity and many of them, especially the men, were slaughtered. Um, that was often just a technique that a conquering army would use. They would kill the men and keep the women and children. Uh, less rebellion that way. Now, this verse is even quoted in the New Testament. Uh, I think it's uh, Matthew 3, it's quoted. When uh, Herod kills all of the male children under two years old, uh, the, the writer of Matthew, Levi, uh, decides to quote this from Jeremiah 31, because once again, 
all the males of Israel under a certain age here were killed. And the, uh, the mothers of Israel were unable to be comforted because of the devastation of their children dying. And that is simply the case uh, because of the curse that every woman who has ever given birth to a child, unless that child is still alive today because their life has not expired, they have died. Genesis 3.17, moving on to the curse on the male. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Now, until this time, man had been placed in a garden where uh, where the garden would be grown by God to sustain him. Man was supposed to have a part in the labor of God, but not for the purpose of survival, but for the purpose of fellowship. Now with that fellowship broken, God is putting the impetus on man to work for his food in order to survive. Um, and so this is an addition where toil or uh, bitter labor is added um, just so that man can keep living. Uh, this life isn't going to be sustained by God in the same way that it was originally intended to, and that is because of the curse. Genesis 3.19, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But then here, after these curses on mankind, where Childbirth is going to be increased and pain is going to be increased. And now they have to work just to survive. And he is eventually going to die anyways. When this is finished, the man calls his wife's name Eve because she is the mother of all living. So man has a, a lesson here. He did not listen to the word of God. He did not trust God when he said, don't eat from this tree didn't trust the will of God, but here he's learned to trust the will of God. And so when God says she's going to bear children, and one of those children is going to conquer the enemy, he believes that. So he calls her the mother of all living. And the Lord God made a made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them, he covered them. And this uh, probably stems from the promise that was made implicitly in Genesis 3.15. Speaking to the serpent and giving its curse, he says, between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, her, uh, her descendants. He, looking at a specific one of those descendants, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the head. Eve is looking forward to one who is going to one from her own body who is going to save them. Um, she thinks it's Cain. Uh, First verse of Genesis 4 shows that um, she thought when she gave birth to Cain, which was her first child, uh, that this would be the savior that was promised. That turns out not to be the case. What happens? He ends up causing her uh, the sort of pain that was promised in the curse. Uh, he said, uh, this is God now speaking to Cain. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground. We have this bitter lamentation because of death and pain and uh, these curses where God intended this creation for blessing. Even looking forward into Genesis 5.29, we have this hope of the coming seed where Lamech thinks that his son Noah is the one who's going to give them rest from what? From our work and from our toil, uh, the toil of our hands arising from the ground, which the Lord has cursed. He thinks Noah is going to be the one to roll back the curse. That ends up not happening. Noah ends up uh, having to curse his own uh, grandchild because of his own sin and his grandson's sin together with him. Looking into Genesis 50, we see the lamentation over the death of Jacob, again, one of these promised seeds. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan. They lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation and he observed seven days mourning for his father, Jacob. Now, this is not really building towards the point here, but this is kind of an interesting aside. Look at Genesis 50, 11. Now, when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, this mourning that they were doing for uh, Jacob, 
they said, this is grievous mourning for the Egyptians. So first, they see Joseph and all of his clan coming out of Egypt, mourning for the death of their father, Jacob. And they think that they're Egyptians. They're living in the land of Egypt. They come out for a bit to bury their father. They mourn over him for a time, and then they stop. But they mourn over him, and these Canaanites think that these are Egyptians. Uh, therefore, it was named Abel Mitzrayim. Now, Abel is the Hebrew word here for Abel, and Mitzrayim is the name of Egypt. But Abel is translated as either the field of the Egyptians, the crying of the Egyptians, or the funeral of the Egyptians, which is beyond the Jordan. So this word Abel um, has become, or Abel has become the name for field, uh, for mourning or weeping or crying or funeral, um, this idea of death in a field and crying over it. So it's interesting how language here develops that they have this historical memory of Cain and Abel and uh, what happened in their history, even among the Canaanites. All right. Moving into Deuteronomy 34, we see that Israel weeps for Moses when Moses dies. In Exodus 3.7, we see the affliction of the people who are in Egypt, and they have given heed, or God has given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are pressed in them. Even Jesus is... Uh, moved by death and by other people's um, mourning over death. In John eleven thirty two. 32, therefore, when Mary came uh, where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died, speaking of Lazarus. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her saw, or Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So Jesus being the, uh, the presence of God made manifest to mankind, Jesus, God dwelling among man, he came down and he experienced the curse together with mankind. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter four is going to use this as an argument that he is a sympathetic high priest. He has come and suffered in the same way that we have. He has been in the flesh. He has experienced the curse. But here in the new heavens and the new earth, this curse is not just rolled back. It is gone. There is no more curse. He is creating a creation without the curse and without the uh, future possibility of a curse because everyone who is populating this has been redeemed, restored, identified with their Messiah, Jesus Christ. They are in him. He is in us. There is no longer any death. There's no longer any possibility of death. Pain is gone. Everything associated with the curse, it's gone. The first things have passed away. Isaiah 65, 20, this is in the millennial kingdom. Now, Arnold Fruchtenbaum rightly says, while the millennial kingdom is the high point of Old Testament prophecy, the eternal order is the high point of New Testament prophecy. This is important when dealing with Isaiah 65, which is the millennial kingdom. It looks like it's the very end of all things, because the very end of all things had not yet been revealed. And so uh, this is a bit of an accordion where we are looking at times at um, shadows of what is to come after the millennial kingdom, but we are looking at what is accomplished in the millennial kingdom. And so here is one of the descriptions of the kingdom where we see that the kingdom simply cannot be the eternal state. Isaiah 65, 20 says, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. So the curse is going to be rolled back during the millennial kingdom. You're not going to have infant mortality. You're not going to have uh, sinful activity like abortion. The children that are conceived will be born. Those children that are born will live into adulthood. They will live at least until the age of 100. Those who are not regenerated um, by faith in the Messiah, who will be reigning as their, as their king in the kingdom, 
those who do not trust him for life and salvation, those will die at the age of 100 because they will come under the curse that was in the uh, from Adam and Eve because they have not been regenerated by Jesus Christ. They come under the curse. Isaiah 65, 22, they will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, which is thousands of years, if it's in good conditions, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. But eventually, those who are not regenerated, who do exist in the millennial kingdom, but do not exist in the eternal state, those will die. But the reason why we have all of this restoration, the reason why we are able to look at a future that has no curse in existence at all, and the reason that God is able to create um, carrying through uh, regenerated people from this uh, creation into the next is because of the work of Christ. It is a finished and final work that does not just have implications on the past or the present, but into the future as well. Isaiah 53, 3, we begin to see how Christ took on the curse himself. He received the penalty of mankind's sin, despite having no sin himself. And in that, he finished the wrath of God. Isaiah 53, 3 says he was pierced through for our transgressions. No longer for us, but for him. He was crushed for our iniquities. We are no longer crushed for them. He was crushed for them. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. In John 19, we see that Pilate took Jesus, and he scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. They literally placed the curse on his head. They put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. Uh, and they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews! and to give him slaps in the face. Now, this word for purple uh, in the Greek, it's difficult to distinguish whether this is purple or red. Um, I don't think it matters that much here. It is a dark purple maroon robe. Uh, it is both a royal color, um, but it is the, uh, the color of blood as well. They are mocking his kingship, but at the same time, they are also mocking the atonement, which he is about to um, bring in. And this atonement is what is ultimately going to roll back the curse and destroy the curse forever. Again, Jesus did experience the curse, and he experienced it most prominently as he was about to die for mankind who was under the curse. In Luke twenty two forty four, 44, uh, the night before he was crucified, we read that he was in agony and he was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. I think this is very purposefully worded to remind us of the curse that his, by the sweat of his brow, he would work the ground and the ground would not produce for him. Here we've got Jesus Christ sweating and his blood dripping even into the ground where he was cursed. Um, because of man's sin. Jesus is going to fix all of that. And Jesus, now looking back, has fixed all of that. We are just waiting for the results to catch up with what is true uh, of his finished work. Hebrews 5 7 says that in the days of his flesh, that is during his incarnation while he was on earth in the hypostatic union, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one. Uh, able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety or his awe or his reverence. Um, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now, this is where mankind went wrong. Mankind was not obedient to the will of God. God said to, uh, to execute his will over creation and man chose instead to separate their wills from God's and to obey the will of the serpent instead. But here, God's only son, his perfect and unique um, son, who shares the same deity and essence as he does, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Jesus Christ was perfectly obedient to God, even to the point of dying for the sins of other people, being perfectly sinless himself. Christ was obedient where we were not. Um, I've heard it said in kind of a cliche now, but it's 
yeah, I mean, cliches come from truth, just oft repeated truth, that Adam was faithless in regards to the tree, and Christ was faithful in regards to the tree. By one came death, by the other came life. And that is very true. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. And so Christ is the glorious Son of God who makes us sons of God when we become identified with him through faith. Hebrews 5, 9 says, and having been made perfect. Now, this is uh, a point of interpretation here in the text. What does it mean that Jesus was made perfect? Well, I think this is the results of his resurrection. He was perfectly obedient to God, and as being perfectly obedient to God, he earned um, he earned this perfection. He earned the right to be the king over this creation because he showed himself faithful to God. So in his resurrection, when God restores him to life, he comes back perfect. His flesh is no longer um, subject to death. He cannot die. He has suffered death already, and he is alive forevermore. And so he became to all those who obeyed him and his command to them that they have either to obey or disobey is to believe in him. He became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Hebrews goes into a long explanation of why uh, Christ's high priesthood is better than the high priesthood of uh, Levi and the Levitical priesthood, because Melchizedek has, of course, uh, no end and no beginning, because we don't see where he came from or where he went, um, but he is a priest before God. This is the same as Jesus Christ. He is a priest before God with no end and no beginning. But what is a priest? A priest stands before one party and represents them to another. He stands between us and God, and he's able to represent us because he is one of us. He is a human being. He has taken on flesh. He underwent the, uh, the experience of the curse. He underwent death for us. He has the same flesh that we have, but without sin. And so he is able to accurately represent us to God, but he's able to represent us to God where we are not because he is also one with God. He shares in God's nature. So by the simple fact that Jesus Christ is both perfectly God and perfectly man, he is the only one able to stand as our high priest. And so he uh, stands between us and God and represents us and God so that we can stand between God and creation and represent him over this earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. And this is how he was perfected. The first fruits of those who were asleep, the beginning, the very beginning um, of this resurrection from the dead was Jesus Christ. All others who are resurrected are resurrected into his resurrection. For since by a man came death by Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So remember that a fallen man produces fallen men. But Christ, being not a fallen man, but a resurrected, a perfected man, produces perfected men. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but each in his own order, this order of resurrection, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming, speaking of uh, the uh, resurrection of the dead and the rapture, because this is Paul writing during the church age. And then comes the end. Now he's looking forward beyond the millennial kingdom. And he says, when he hands over the kingdom, Christ has to first have the kingdom in order to hand over the kingdom. And he hands it over to God, the father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. That's what we've been looking at in the book of Revelation. Paul is um, editing his statements here uh, to speak only of redemption history. He has skipped over the period of the kingdom where Jesus Christ uh, fulfills God's purposes in creation, and he's looking forward um, to the uh, final vindication of mankind. When death was experienced in the fall, this is the final, uh, the final crushing of the serpent's head where death itself is abolished. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, for he must reign in his kingdom until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be abolished is death. 
death will still be present during the kingdom, but it will only be for those who are not identified in their Messiah through faith. But after the kingdom is concluded, when he hands that kingdom over to his father, death itself will also be put away so that that will never be experienced by anyone ever again. Uh, jumping ahead in the chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, we read, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now there will be flesh and blood in the kingdom, but we will not inherit it unless we are in spirit, in Christ. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, those who are asleep at his coming, but who are Christ's, and we will be changed. Those of us who are alive uh, at the time of Christ's return, we will be changed. Now, we will enter into his kingdom uh, as changed individuals. One way or another, you, are, you and I will not enter into his kingdom in flesh and blood, but we will enter in through his perfection, where we will be perfected at the time where we come face to face with him. This is the uh, finishing of our salvation. For the perishable must put on the imperishable and the mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on imper the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? So no notice this is, a, uh, this is put in sequence. First, Christ is going to redeem those who are his. First, we are going to be uh, transformed out of our present state and into a new state. And then death is going to be swallowed up so that uh, the flesh will disappear. Um, but we will have our new flesh in him, our resurrection bodies. First Corinthians 15, 53, the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. That is the standard of God. That is what puts us to death because we deserve to die uh, when we are measured up against God's holiness, righteousness, and, uh, and perfection. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not thanks be to those who have measured up themselves. The whole point is that we cannot measure up. But we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ because he was faithful to the point of death because he and he alone could be and because he represents us before God. And when we have faith in him, when we have believed in him, we are at that moment co-crucified and co-resurrected with him. And now we stand with him in new life. So because of his victory, we cannot lose. Because of his victory, all these things that we are looking forward to, this kingdom that we will be transferred into at his return his this uh, new heavens and new earth where the curse will no longer exist. This is our experience because of what he has already done. And this is already guaranteed to us because he holds us secure in his hand. Second Corinthians 15, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and that is true of everyone who has believed in him, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. We are already identified with this new creation. We are already made new and we are just waiting up for our experience to catch up because what is positionally true of us will eventually become our experience. But in order that God may be gracious to those who have not yet believed, this experience is delayed. There are some who will believe who have not yet believed and we are waiting for them. And then God will sum up all things in Christ after he has um, been vindicated in this creation through Jesus Christ.